Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. All right, a couple of things I want to say. I want to talk about something very uh, special tonight. One is I endorse everything Chris said at the beginning. One, one of the problems, uh, being in ministry for so long, I, I know how things work and how in many expressions of church there is a subtle pressure that helps to keep certain things in order um, because there is either a spoken or when there is not a spoken, there is an implication um, that not to do something carries with it a penalty. And I've been in church long enough to know that sometimes that was never really said, but I know that I, I, I felt it and I knew the rules. And uh, some of those things keep us in order. Have you ever wondered why God did not give the law of Moses to the children of Israel until they'd made three months' journey into the wilderness? Uh, in a journey that was supposed to take 11 days, uh, and then finished up, supposed to take two years, and finished up taking 40 years, um, that should say something to all of us about the tendency of our human nature to start out with the best of intentions, uh, but then complicate things along the way by what, what the book of Hebrews calls our own disobedience, okay? We don't enter into the rest we could have done. And so three months in, God gives them this thing that we know as the law and the commandments. Why didn't he do it before that? Because he never wanted to do that. It was all supposed to be very nice and relational. And we love you, God, and you love us, and we thank you. You're our father, and so we're going to cross the desert knowing you're our father, and we're your children, and we're going to enter the land of promise. Uh, but the problem was God had to introduce some stuff that brought pressure on their lives, because it seemed that that would only ever be the way that he could get them to wake up to what the reality was of the promise. Now, in Christ Jesus, we have been set free from the law. And therefore, I as a leader do not want to live in an environment where we have to subtly or subconsciously or any other way use implications that if you don't keep this rule or you don't do that or you don't do that, there's a penalty and a price to pay. We have removed all that. But that's why the Bible says love one another. That's why the Bible talks about kindness, being kind to one another. And uh, in that process, we, we all need to learn that the obligation upon us under this kind of system becomes very different, but it means that we ourselves have to grow up, okay, because law is for children, right? Grown-up people shouldn't need it. So in our maturity of growing up, we have to understand sometimes as well that Hebrews also says who the Lord loves, he disciplines. In other words, there does come a time sometimes when we have to say something about some things. Now, how many of you know that's when human beings, we take the huff? We never take the huff while anybody's saying, you're doing brilliant, that's fantastic, you're amazing, you're the best of the bunch. We only ever take the huff when somebody says, no, it can't be this way. That actually is the measure of our maturity, okay? The strength of a relationship is not dictated by how many times you're told yes, it's dictated by what you do in the odd time that you're told no. I mean, you know with your kids, if you're always saying yes, things are okay. And you think they really love you and obedient until the time you have to say no. And then you find out where the level of maturity is. So uh, forgive me for saying this, I'm speaking it as a pastor, as a pastor's heart to you, that our relationships are best tested when there is a no, Okay. So it gives a good indicator to us. Now, the truth is, that should never be a breaking point. It should be an encouraging point because it's all coming in a process of love and we grow together and we learn together. It's just part of the necessity of life. But we're not going to put things back under law and under obligation. But we should work better in love than we ever did in law. Okay? So be considerate to one another. Um, uh, respect, that's the word I was looking for. 
a word came into my heart was down there, which is the word respect. We have to govern our actions, not just out of ourselves, but out of respect for others. Respect for others means, how will what I am about to choose to do affect the other people? Right? Now, it doesn't mean you've broken the law, done anything wrong. It just means that respect says, I will consider how this will affect the others. So it dictates certain things in our lives that, that may cause a little disruption for us, but we do it out of respect for others. I want us to respect each other, okay? That means we can make room where room needs to be made, and we can tighten where things need to be tightened. But as we show respect to one another, we build a better community, and we build a better environment, and hopefully everybody then feels the sense of that respect. Is that okay? Good. All right, so, um, next week I want to talk to you about churchsucks.com. I hope you don't find the language offensive, because uh, that word is simply, uh, culturally, is, is a word that is very common for meaning something's not. So whatever word you want to put in, that's fine. But I'm going to talk to you about that uh, next week for, <clears throat> for some very specific reasons that I think will, will, will help us. <clears throat> so tonight, um, one of the things that I have to do from time to time because of featuring in <clears throat> some program or event is to write a bio. How many of you know what a bio is? A bio is short for biopic. It means <clears throat> you are making us... You are writing something about yourself. It's a biopic about you, okay? So you have to do it for these events and for programs. Um, hopefully, or not, I guess, depends. Uh, it doesn't become a biopic, okay? These things are supposed to be brief. <clears throat> um, but really, it's something that says, hopefully, in as few words as possible, something that summarizes who we are, but because you have to write it about yourself, it tends to be it summarizes who you think you are. Okay. Now, um, I have read some bios and met the people who were the subject of the bio. I'll just smile at that because <laughs> words can't express. Now, now, you may look at me and say, but we're never in that situation, Ant. But the truth is, all of you have done this exercise, even if only in your mind. <clears throat> you have a bio about you. <clears throat> One of the problems is, when our bio is contradicted by someone else, okay? <clears throat> so while trying to downplay the desperate need to be recognized and applauded as, as the superior being that you know you are, a spoonful of humility is inserted in some form in an attempt to try and make it look like you are not blowing your own trumpet, but doing all this under great duress, <clears throat> whilst at the same time ensuring that people are left in no doubt about how magnificent you are, humbly illustrating why you should be afforded the status of legend and be listened to as you share your personal version of the ideas you stole from somebody else. <clears throat> That's basically what a bio is. <clears throat> um, there was a time in my life when, uh, much as I tried to repress and redress it, um, I was, I guess, a legend in my own mind. Uh, a phenomenon in my own perception, and an expert in my own ego system. <clears throat> much like most of you, but you've never had to write it down. Some of you will say, oh no, not I. I'm just nothing, I'm, I'm rubbish, I, I, I'm so weak and insignificant. But that can actually be a form of inverted pride. That stating, I am the most not I person that I know. I am the epitome of nothingness. I am so rubbish, I personally constitute a whole landfill. There is nothing recyclable about me. I am the weakest of the weak, and my insignificance is legendary. Now, do you see what I mean? It's the same thing. It's the same thing. It's an inverted pride. 
It's a way to present oneself because both of these scenarios expose one thing. Love me because I am something or love me because I am nothing, but please love me. Each one of them actually, in its pride of boastfulness and the other in its pride of nothingness, is actually an attempt to say, love me. Look how special I am, love me. Or for some of you, look how terrible I am, love me. But it's the same thing. Life radically changes most bios over the years. I remember struggling to write them, and of course you look at what other people have written, and so all the stuff about how many nations of the world you've spoken in, and how many sparks you flash from your fingers, and lightning bolts from other members of your anatomy, and all that stuff finds its way into these incredible bios. You ought to read some of them sometime. And um, I probably got caught up in that, because you, you think you have to, this is what you have to do. Of course, the buzzwords now, if you want to impress people, is, is uh, multi-site, that has to be in. Our church is multi-site, and you have to use the word campus, okay? These are the buzzwords now, that if your bio's worth anything, they have to go in there, and it's all about who you're covering, and all that kind of stuff goes in there, but, but what I've found is that, is that, that, Life radically changes most bios over the years. So I've been there. Um, this, the, these were my two latest. I'm a man who often struggles with the issues of value and inadequacy. This regularly develops into an overwhelming sense of self-loathing. I have been reduced by grace to find my hope in only one source. I do not pastor a mega church. I'm not on TV broadcasting to millions, nor am I an apostle to tens of thousands in the nations of the earth. I do not have my own radio show or feature in the Christian press. I have for the past 25 years been trying to lead a wonderful crowd of people at the Rock Church York, be a good husband to my wonderful wife, Chris, and become at some point, hopefully, a great father to our children, Joel and Connie, and a dear and precious granddad to my grandson, Riley. I'm a man who is trying to live daily under the loving gaze of a compassionate father, and experience the grace and mercy that flows to me regardless of all my weakness and failure. I'm a man locked into discovering in each moment the relentless tenderness of Jesus, hoping that each day Christ might be proud to write his signature over my life. This was the other one. As bios can often be the preacher's opportunity to stroke his or her own ego and propel the legend which is themselves beyond the boundaries of their own mind, I prefer to simply say, I am a man loved by God and touched by grace offering my contribution to this great conversation about the divine, hoping to say something that will have eternal significance to somebody and make my presence on this planet mean something. So, if you had to write a bio, what would it say? If you now had to pick up your pen or get out your laptop and write your bio, what would it say? How much nonsense would there be in there of you desperately trying to love yourself and get others to love you in one way or another? How much of it would reflect the reality of your journey and not the fantasy of a journey that you imagine exists. I love the honesty of the Psalms in the Bible. I love the expression at times of these people being angry with God, confused before God, struggling and wrestling with issues, but knowing actually that if they're writing a bio about themselves, it has to be about them and not some imaginary thing. So I challenge you, this week, Sit down, write your bio. 
I haven't read what I read to try and impress you. I hope some of you know me enough to know that that's the real story of the real Anth. And that's, that's the persona that I struggle with and wrestle with. But that's the grace that I find and the tenderness in Jesus. What will you write? What can you write? Can you write past your offences and your disillusionment? Can you write your confusion into your bio? Or are you still trying to pull the mask over other people's eyes as to who you really are? Or can you, in grace, honestly express, this is me in my journey? I challenge you to do that this week. Challenge you to ask God just to shine a light in your own heart and then write, write a reflection of what you see in your heart, not what you think people might be looking for from you. I don't know if you know it, but Jesus had a bio. And it came out of a spiritual experience of encountering God as Father. That's always the best place for it to come from. So, so Jesus has been in obscurity for, for 30 years bar a few days. Okay. The reason I say bar a few days is because uh, when Jesus was about to be, have his bar mitzvah, as a Jewish boy at 12 years of age and was taken along to the temple, he was talking with the, the scribes and the, the rulers of the, the synagogue. He was discussing things that a boy of his age, they thought, were just, <laughs> just mind-blowing. Then he disappears have not a single word written about him for what turns out to be another 18 years. So we have his birth. We have little record. We know that he was taken to Egypt as a refugee because Herod was killing the babies. We know that. We know so at some point he came back to Nazareth. But then we have nothing. Then we have this just one incident that takes place over two days and then we have nothing. Until at 30 years of age, Jesus turns up at, at the River Jordan and John the Baptist, this, this guy who is, he's preaching a message that so many people misinterpret. John was pre preaching a message that was saying, you need to make a way, prepare a way so, so God can turn up. It wasn't make a way for you to get to God. It's make a way for God to get to you. Let's level the rough places and let's, let's bring down the stuff that's high and lift up the things that just make a path so, so God can get to you. And of course, God was getting to us when, when Jesus, Jesus turns up. And um, he goes to John to be baptized. It's a whole story in its own right, which I'm not going to uh, wrestle with tonight before you. But as he's baptized, believe this or not, I, I believe it intensely. And I think both as a picture of what happens in encounters with God and as a real experience, John baptizes him in the Jordan. And then the Bible records that, that heaven opened. I don't think everybody saw it. Some people thought it just thundered or whatever, but, but, but it says a voice spoke and, and said, you are my son, I love you, I'm pleased with you. And um, of course there's the whole thing of the dove, the Holy Spirit coming in the form of a dove, whatever you make of all that, the issue is that, that in that declaration, um, something happened in, in the direction of Jesus' life. And uh, it makes this strange statement because it says he was led by the Spirit into the desert where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. Now, um, from this encounter, something was leading his life that it would appear was not in the same strength or magnitude before that point. Now, we could argue that heavily, but what I propose to you is the word Christ or Christos means anointed. Jesus was not the Christos, the Christ, 
until after his baptism. Therefore, I propose to you that whatever happened at the baptism, there was a special relationship with the Father, and what was happening in that relationship was he was led by the Spirit. Something went on inside him that revolutionized the course of his own life. I believe that happens when we have a real encounter with the Father. And so he finishes up in the desert, and it says where for 40 days he's tempted by by the devil. Now, whether you think that's a, a devil as a real person, whether you, whatever you think, because there's a lot of conversation about, about the words for devil that means adversary. One thing we can be sure of is that there was an adversarial event taking place in, in the desert. Okay? And what's interesting is that it's, it, it's Jesus' bio is actually being formed in this process. So its formation in his heart came in the most trustworthy place for the formation of these things, which was the desert, the dark night of the soul. Great bios are not formed in wonderful meetings in churches because you learn nothing. See, why do people drink too much alcohol? Why do, why do people take drugs? Why do we do a lot of the things we do? Because it's, it's a mood-altering substance. And likewise, in a church meeting, one can, and I know exactly how to do it, I, I put my shirt on it, I could get on that piano today, even though some of you didn't know I could even play that piano, and bring an atmosphere that would be mood altering. I could do that. And there's nothing wrong with that because it's mood altering experiences are good. I don't know if you realize it, but we go to concerts for a mood altering experience. We don't go to sit there and think. We go because we want the music to wash over our soul. We want, we want the artist to bring their thing. And so we use a term, the X factor. And some people have it, some people don't. We took Connie to a Barry Manilow concert, of all things, in Vegas. You know, it's like, well, Connie, her age, and Barry Manilow, she absolutely loved it because the place was electric. The guy has the X factor. He is a showman. It was mood-altering, and you could feel it in the building, and we've all felt those kind of things. Steve feels that when he's on the cop in Liverpool. It's mood-altering. Sometimes creating great anger and disappointment that lasts for days, and sometimes, hopefully this Wednesday, creating great delight. Those are not the places where, where the true bio of our life are formed. The true bio of our life are formed in the dark place, in, in the reality of the challenges that we face, the, the things that we have failed in, our inability, our lack of strength, is where a true bio is really formed because that's the real you that's, that's coming out. And so, and so the bio of Jesus is being formed, and I'm going to show you what I mean in a moment. The bio of Jesus is being formed in this adversarial place called the desert through the days and through the nights. So it's 40 days and 40 nights. Why doesn't it just say 40 days? Because it's 40 nights as well. Why is it 40 nights? How many of you know... How you handle things in the day and how you handle things in the night are two very different things. It's good advice to say, if you're concerned about something, don't go making decisions in the middle of the night because you'll probably make the wrong decision because you're not emotionally equipped to cope with that decision when you are in a tired and worn out state. You know that everything seems worse, harder, more difficult, more challenging. You swear in the middle of the night, it's definitely not going to work out. I'll be dead by the morning. I won't have the money in the night. So why is it 40 days and 40 nights? Because in the day and the night, this is being formed. It's a balanced thing. You can't form it just by the good experiences. It has to be formed within the bad experiences. And so three temptations were leveled at Jesus, or three challenges, three adversarial challenges. Every single one of them was directed 
at his identity. If you are the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. Listen, if you bow down to me, identity, submit who you are to who I am, I have been given all the kingdoms of the world and I can give them to whoever I want. If you bow down to me, if you, if you don't hold on to your identity, I'll make this easy for you. Listen, go put yourself on the top of the temple. Throw yourself down because the Bible says he's given his angels charge over you. If you're really the son of God, God can't let you die. Every single one of the temptations was directed at his identity. Why is that? Because the key to resolving the challenge called life is the resolving of the problem called identity. Struggling with your identity. When Jesus was baptized, it cemented his identity. What did the Father tell him? Oh, you go here and do that and perform this miracle and stand on that platform and preach this message. No, all the Father said to him is, you're my son. I love you, I'm pleased with you. It was identity. The secret to this success was entirely and totally bound up in the realization of his identity. Who he was to the Father and who the Father was to him. So the challenge of the adversary of Satan, of whoever you want to call him, the enemy, was all about if he can disrupt your identity, he can disrupt your world. But whenever your identity is secure, see what I read to you about my current bio is not a statement of insecurity, that's the statement of my security. My security is not in me, it's not in my strength, it's not in my power, it's not in my ability. My security is in the relentless tenderness of Jesus, a love that never fails, a relationship with the Father. So this whole thing of identity is critical. So you say, well, well, how do you mean that Jesus' bio was being written in those experiences? Because remember it said he was led by the Spirit into the desert where for 40 days and 40 nights he was tempted by the devil. And um, it then says in verse 14 of Luke chapter 4, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. News about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. And he went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. And the scroll or the book of the prophet Isaiah from the Old Testament was handed to him, and unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. All of a sudden, he's now got bold statements about his standing, his identity, in the context of his, his existence. Now, I'm just going to say one thing about this. The spirit that is on you will determine what you say and believe about yourself. So, I have another question. I asked the question, if you were to write a bio... What would it say? My other question is, what is the spirit that's on you? Because the spirit that's on you will determine what you say and believe about yourself. And that can be everything from incredible pride and arrogance that resists everybody and everything to what seems to be the depth of humility of, oh, I'm so bad and I'm so weak and I'm so terrible. The spirit that is upon you will determine what you say and believe about yourself. So he returns in the power of the spirit and what he says is a revelation of what he believes about himself. The spirit of the Lord is on me. He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind and to release the oppressed. All this is a result of, of finding his identity. And this is now his bio written because of the days and nights in the desert. To release the oppressed. 
and verse 19, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll or shut the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. Which Chris pointed out a few weeks ago, very, very important. He was reading from the book of Isaiah, what we know as verse 1 and verse 2. And verse 2 of the book of Isaiah does not finish where Jesus shut the book. The book of Isaiah carries on and the next thing that it says after a comma that proclaim the year of the Lord's favor is to proclaim the day of vengeance and the day of vengeance of the Lord our God. Here's my thought on that. There is something about finding one's identity that deals with the vengeance that we otherwise feel in our hearts. Vengeance shows up as anger, it shows up as judgment, it shows up as bitterness. It shows up as revenge, it shows up as retribution, that's called vengeance. But somehow, when we find our real identity, it deals with the vengeance that we would otherwise feel in our heart. What I'm trying to show you is that many of us in here today have an identity problem and that's where this thing roots. We don't really know who we are in God, which is why I want you to sit down this week and attempt to write a bio because it's going to say things about who you think you are and the spirit that you are under will be shown when you start to write this thing out because believe me, these things I know from experience you don't sit down and in two minutes rattle this off. You think, oh, I'm going to sit down and write this. Then three hours later, you're thinking, what should I be writing? And then, of course, you start coming out with all kinds of nonsense about who you think you are or who you think other people think you should be. But when you get past that and start digging into the experience of your desert, your dark nights your frustrations, your confusion, and you start to find somewhere in there the identity that God has given you, which is rooted in him, not in you. Jesus said, by myself I can do nothing. Jesus said that, but what the Father shows me I do, what the Father says I do, there is a vital link there that you can have in the same way that Jesus had it. So one more verse, then I'm going to shut up. Matthew 11, verse 29, Jesus said this, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your soul. Rest doesn't come out of the resolution of aggravation. Rest comes out of a relationship with gentleness and humility. And Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. Of course, for most of you young people, you think he's talking about an egg. Thinking, why would Jesus want us to have an egg on... You know, it's right, isn't it? Why would Jesus want us to have an egg on us? You know, take my yoke upon you. Of course, he doesn't mean that. The yoke was a, was a, was a wooden implement that you would fasten two animals together. It went across the neck of one and the neck of another with a light chain, and what happened is it meant that, that when you were yoked, you were connected. And you would always have a lead animal in the yoke that was taking the strain and making the pace and determining the direction. So when Jesus said, listen, he said, take my yoke upon you. First, he says, come to me. Chris mentioned it. Come to me, you're weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. But this is how it happens. Take my yoke upon you. Or in other words, identify yourself inseparably with me. That's where the strength is, okay? Do it on your own if you want. But you ain't going to find the rest you're looking for. If you will yoke yourself inseparably to me, Jesus said, you'll find that I'm gentle and humble in heart. And the consequence of that is you become gentle and humble in heart. Because he said you, not, not him, you will find rest for your soul. You, you will find rest for your soul in this process. Why? Because now your identity has become secure. Like Jesus, the Father said, you're my son, I love you. Jesus in that moment was yoked to the Father. So, so he made some strange statements that are yoke statements. He says, I and my Father are one. That's a yoke statement. I'm connected to him. 
So my identity comes from him. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why? Because we are together. So Jesus said, if you do this, you find rest for your souls. For he says this, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's suggesting that other yokes are not easy and the burden is not light. In between the lines thing, we're all yoked to somebody or something. The question is, is what you are yoked to burdensome, heavy, or is it light? See, these are all measures to know who are we yoked to? What is the spirit that is on us? What's the bio about us are all indicators of whether we have put ourselves into that place of being yoked to him, Jesus, who is yoked to the Father so that that lightness of that yoke helps us because we are now have an identity that is secure because our identity is inseparable from his identity and he's secure and his identity is inseparable from the father and the father's identity is secure and so what we find in this then is that the bio of Jesus becomes our bio because if he says the spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor and I'm yoked to him what happens? the spirit of the Lord is on me He's anointed me to bring good news. Why? Because I'm yoked to him. Why is it easy? Because it's not my strength. It's not my effort. It's not my energy. I'm just going where the one I'm yoked to is connected. And we have strength to liberate and bring life and healing and open blind eyes in all of this. A yoked identity is the way to go. So wrapping up, uh, I read to you a few weeks ago, what I think currently is the church's bio, the rock. First and foremost, I want you to be yoked to Jesus. That's, that's always been the desire. Um, I read some things this week going through some material we had to do because of the move we're making into the new offices, which... Uh, some people were saying that they felt the whole thing was that we were trying to yoke them to the rock or I was trying to yoke them to me. I've never done that intentionally and I apologize if that has been uh, what has happened. Some very unkind things were said in that, in that context. But my desire has always been and still is and even more so to yoke you to Jesus. Because I know that in that yoking, you yoke to the Father. And when we're all yoked together like that, the truth is we don't have to be fussing about rules and regulations and requirements and expectations because if we're all yoked together, do you understand? The whole thing moves together, right? And we all share a common identity. Not because we've lost our personality, but because our identity is in Christ. Because now our identity has come from those experiences and we're now sharing that, our honesty, coming into his honesty, that means that our weaknesses become strong in him. Our sadness becomes joy in him. There is a transfer takes place because of, because of that yoke. But this, this, is, this is how I would bio the church now and why I want you to be here so we can keep walking this journey together. Our reason for teaching and being is to sharpen your axe. Remember where the axe is dull or not sharp, more strength is needed. But wisdom makes the job easy. The wisdom is sharpen your axe. You don't need to be a better lumberjack. You don't need to have bigger biceps. You need a sharper axe, okay? We're not trying to make you work harder in life. We're trying to make life easier. You make it easier with a sharp axe. What's the sharp axe? The sharp edge of the axe is the identity of the axe. The axe has no reason for existing apart from its edge. The edge is its identity. You don't look at an axe and think, that's a flipping beautiful, I love the color of that axe. 
Look at the polish on the head of that axe. If it's blunt, what you look for in an axe, you pick it up and you don't do that on the blade, okay? It's a word of wisdom. You don't do that on the blade, okay? You don't, okay? Stupid, stupid, stupid. Then you'll say, oh, that's really sharp. Can somebody get me to a hospital? You test it like that, okay? And you can feel, you can feel this, this, the, it, that edge is so sharp. And that's the identity. It has an identity. Its strength is in its identity. Your strength is in your identity. Christ's strength was in his identity. When we do this yoking thing, that's what we do. So our reason for teaching and being is to sharpen your axe, to give you an edge so you can effectively tackle the issues facing you and those around you in life to aid you to live in the favor that God has proclaimed over your life, free from condemnation, guilt, and shame, and to be part of a never-ending, expanding, peaceable kingdom as a follower of the Jesus who showed us what God looks like so that you can show others the same. So what's your identity? So here's how we finish, the three things. I'd like you to have a goal this week. I wouldn't like you to, I'd like you to discipline yourself, so I have to do this, because this is going to tell me about me, okay? I'm going to write a bio about me this week. I'm going to write the bio of me, my bio. That's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to look to see what is the spirit that is on me. That's my next thing, okay? What is the spirit that is on me? Because that's determining. And then the thing is, who am I yoked to? Who am I yoked to? I want that for you to be, to be Jesus himself tonight. There are many ways that, that the church talks about this thing called salvation. Really, at the end of the day, a lot of terminology. This terminology tonight is this. You get in the yoke with him. You choose Jesus, right? Um, here's the honest thing about me. Here's about you. Identity together. And I commit to that. So I just want to bow your heads for one moment. If you've, if you've never done it, I want you to do it right now. It's your connection with, with God's love for you to say tonight, Father God, I want to be in the yoke that Jesus wears. So where he goes, I go. Who he is, I am. What he has, I have. I want that connection with the Father. It's, it's, all you, it's, it's a choice. It's a, I take that yoke. He said, he said, take my yoke upon you. Now, of course, literally, I can't give you a wooden yoke. So he obviously didn't mean it physically. He meant it in the context of how we take things on ourselves, which we do. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. And you will have a rest for your souls. I pray tonight that the rest that only comes from one source, because it's the kind of rest that is not determined or affected by circumstance, will descend on your soul right now, because of God's love in Jesus, because of heaven opened over you, because of the Father saying, you're my son, you're my daughter, I love you. I'm pleased with you. I pray peace in your soul right now. Peace in your soul. Whether you've got a boastful identity or whether you've got a shameful identity, both are equally wrong. Peace to your soul. Peace to your soul. Relax. Love is on the way. Relax. Love is on the way. I pray strength to you. And that you be conscious right now from this moment of the leading of the Spirit. I don't mean that in a super spooky way. You know, oh, well, you know, I didn't. I mean just inside of you, something just moving you along, speaking to you, helping you. 
giving you the nudge, giving you the green light, giving you the guidance, led by the Spirit. I pray that over you tonight. That you'll experience that you're being led by the Spirit. It's quite amazing, it's quite simple, but it's also quite shocking because you know that it's for real. I pray that over you tonight. And so, Father, thank you. Thank you for all your dealings in our life. Thank you for being there for us, being our shield, being our protector, being the place that we can run to, being the one who is gentle and merciful and kind towards us. We just let that wash over our souls tonight and receive it in Jesus' name because you are good and you're with us and you'll never forsake us. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We are done. Thank you. Um, you don't have to submit your bio to me, incidentally, for me to mark it. But you can, okay? So I, I do want to say that to you. Some, sometimes accountability is good for us. So for some of you, if you would like to say, Anth, you know, this is what I wrote, can I please just give it to you? I would be delighted to, to have it and to receive it. And you know this is not a judgmental house, you know. And uh, if it's one of these, you know, I'm so amazing and smart, I just can't understand why everybody doesn't realize. I'll, I'll tell you. But I think you've been warned enough about that. Um, but yeah, by all means, I'm, I'm more than happy to encourage you. And, and if you want to bring something to me, please, please do. And we'll just accept that and pray over it and believe God and thank God for what he's doing in your life in bringing you in this process. Because remember, the adversarial thing was all dealing with identity. All the adversarial things in your life have one objective. That's to disrupt your identity in God and in Christ. So we're not going to let it happen, are we? All right, so uh, we've had some good stuff. Now you can watch the nonsense. All right. Particularly the voting. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the Rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support The Rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.